Let us pray. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I don't know how many of you get the Wisconsin State Journal, um, but this past Thursday there was a comic in there. It's called Real Life Adventures. It's a single panel comic. And um, the picture was of a daughter seated at the dinner table and her mother standing near the table. And the daughter says to her mother, if this were France, I would have wine with my dinner. Her mother replies, well, since you live in La Provence de Nebraska, you'll be having jus de mou. <laughs> the daughter replies, you and dad are so unsophisticated. Seeing that comic strip reminded me of all of the years when our family would gather with our relatives at somebody's home, and we had a fairly large group of people, so there was never enough room at those big Thanksgiving meals or Christmas meals for all of us to be seated at one table. And so I was very accustomed while growing up to have the host or hostess say to me, oh yeah, you're at the kids' table. You're at the kids' table. And of course, that went on for many years. I remember, as I got into my early teens, finally I was invited to be seated at the adult table. And I knew I had finally arrived. But what a bummer it was the following big dinner we had when some Far-flung relatives from Greeley, Colorado showed up and they said, oh, you're at the children's table again now. I knew it was more important to be at the adult table. There was something special that happened there. Well, in Jesus' day, there was a great awareness of status when it came to table and where you were seated the closer you were to the honored guests, if you will. There was a lot that was tied to your status in the community as to whether you were wealthy or poor, and especially a lot of status tied to religious leadership. So those who were head of the local temple were always treated with greater honor and respect than regular ordinary folks. And so our Bible lessons for today pick up on this cultural reality these ethic rules, if you will, that weren't really written down, but everybody knew who was more important than somebody else. And so in our lessons, we address the issues of humility versus pride or arrogance, and humility versus maybe a skewed sense of entitlement. So I suppose you could look at those couple of verses from Proverbs that Shannon read for us moments ago, and our gospel lesson where Jesus gives the advice about taking the lowest place so that you could be moved up instead of taking a higher place and being humiliated as you're asked to move lower, is sort of the biblical version of mismanners. You could look at this as some good advice on how to avoid an embarrassing moment when it comes to table fellowship. But, as is often the case with Jesus, there is much more here than first meets the eye. There is a lesson that he is trying to teach us. This is not merely good etiquette, and not merely a way that we can learn from the unfortunate mistake of somebody else who sat in the wrong chair. No, instead, this is an example that Jesus uses for his followers on how we are to live and act differently than the rest of the world. That he has an expectation on us when we claim to be his followers that we will do things differently. So this is not so much a lesson about how to save face, but rather a lesson on how to be a disciple of Jesus, how to live with humility and gratitude, and how to live with the heart of a servant. So Jesus includes this important phrase in his teaching, everyone who exalts himself 
will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, we're fortunate to have 2020 hindsight. We can look back at our second lesson from Philippians today, and we can see that Jesus is the perfect example of the one who humbles himself. Jesus became obedient to death, even to death on a cross. So he is that perfect example of humility. I want to take just a little bit closer look at Philippians and unpack a couple words for you to help you fully understand this. You can either just listen in, or if you'd like to open your Bibles again, we're on page 1,827, the second chapter of Philippians. And the author, Paul, begins with some lessons on how we are to live as followers of Jesus, and he uses words like tenderness and compassion and love and humility. But then he goes on in verse 5 to say our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God, meaning Jesus is fully divine. He is God. But he did not consider that equality with God as something to be grasped. That's one of the words I want to talk about. Grasped is a very weak translation of a very powerful word there. The original word carries much more of a sense of exploitation. So it would be that Jesus didn't intend to use his godliness, his divinity, as an opportunity to exploit or control for his own purposes. Didn't want to use that power to abuse, if you will. Okay? But he made himself nothing. Other translations say that he emptied himself. In other words, he poured out the power of being divine. Rather than keeping it within and using that power to grasp, to exploit, he emptied himself and became a servant. A servant. One who waits at tables is the word that's used there. And being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance a man, and that's all about the word becoming flesh. Jesus, the baby in the manger who grows up to be the teacher and Lord and Savior of the world. He became obedient to death. In other words, he experiences what every human being experiences. Not one of us can defeat the power of death. Even death on a cross. Do you notice how after the word cross there's an exclamation point? That's because that is a shocking form of death. It was viewed in Jesus' day as the lowest of the low ways to die. For the Greeks and the Hebrews and even for us today, don't we often talk about different kinds of death? Certain deaths we view as being an okay way to die. We've lived a long life. It's old age. It's been a full life. It was our time. Accidents upset us. But what upsets us even more is people who are victims or maybe are executed. Crucifixion was viewed as the lowest form of death, the most awful kind of death to suffer because it meant you had been convicted of a crime, that you were being executed. It meant you were bad. Your life was cut off because of who you were. And so Jesus takes on the lowest form of death. He humbles himself completely. And then God raises him up. God exalts him. So he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's as if God says to Jesus at the resurrection on that very first Easter morning, friend, come up to a better place. Come up higher. God raises him up. And so this instrument of death, the cross, is suddenly changed into the throne of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. This is the great reversal, the great shock that somehow he who was divine could actually suffer death on a cross. 
But through that cross, rather than it being the lowest of the low, it becomes the highest victory the world has ever seen when he is raised again. Okay, back to our gospel lesson. This whole contrast between being exalted and being humbled and being humbled and being exalted. Did you notice that all the guests in Jesus' story get exactly the opposite of what they wanted? They wanted to take a seat of honor to show off to their friends or to make a statement that I'm better than you. And they end up being humiliated when they are moved lower. When you take the way of the cross, the way of the servant, that is the way in which God raises us up. So Jesus says, don't worry about where you're going to sit. Just take the lowest place and everything will be fine. Or better yet, he says, how about if you just be the server, the servant, the host? How about if you invite people to your table that can't pay you back? Don't just invite those who can return the favor. I read a sobering statistic this past week. I would say that most of us in Jefferson County and the surrounding area do not think of ourselves as particularly rich. We think of ourselves as pretty ordinary, common, middle-of-the-road American folk. The statistic I read was this. Out of the entire world's population of adults who are eligible to get a license and to own a car, only 8% of those folks actually own a car. That means 92% of the world look at those of us who drive or even ride in cars and they see us as rich, and rightly so. If we're a part of the 8%, we are rich in the eyes of the world. We often focus on what we do not have, on what we want, but the truth is, we have been abundantly blessed. God has showered us with incredible riches. And the question that Jesus has for us is, what are you doing with it? When our high school lift group went on their summer mission trip to Memphis this year, they had the opportunity to serve in some shelters and soup kitchens, to help prepare food, and then to hand it out to our modern-day examples of what Jesus refers to as the poor and the blind and the lame and the crippled. So when our high schoolers and the adults who went with them returned, they talked about this. And they could tell us that they understand a little bit more about what it means to truly humble oneself, to take on the heart of the servant to get to know people by name, to feed them, those who cannot repay. You know what's interesting? We're going to be invited to a table in just a moment, to a table where a great price was paid that we could never pay back. We will be handed his body and his blood. Every one of us who comes to this table is going to be seated at the children's table. There's only one who is the host. And once we are fed, once we taste again and see that the Lord is good, once we hear again the promise of forgiveness, we can go forth from this place and we can feed others. We can go forth from this place and embrace others. We can go forth from this place renewed and refreshed for the ministry of servanthood that he calls us to. Oh, by the way, we're not in France, but you will be having wine today. No jus de mou up here. <laughs>
His body, His blood, broken and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Those words are just as powerful today as when they were first spoken in the upper room with the disciples. And they accomplish exactly what they say. Forgiveness and renewal and peace. Will we ever be perfect servants? Will we ever be as generous as God is to us? No, we'll always fall short. But it doesn't mean he stops calling us to be faithful. So let's claim the power of forgiveness and recommit ourselves to humility and to servanthood and to having a mind like Jesus. In his name, amen. You may remain.